Hi, I'm Jason Gorber for ThatShelf.com, and we're here to look at Steely Dan's Gaucho. Big shelf. So, Steely Dan's Gaucho, their last record that they released from their sort of prime period, the 70s, and this is 1980 period. I guess it would be two decades before they came out with a couple of records afterwards. Um, we, we've talked a bunch on this channel about these uh, UHQR, UHQR releases from Analog Productions. They're done on their Clarity vinyl, um, uh, their fancy clear vinyl pressings. The boxes are these sort of quite robust with the wood dowel on the side, like some classic archive releases back in the day. They're very handsome. <laughs> they look sort of great all in a row. That's what's behind me, that and the other one step, some other nonsense. But Steely Dan, look, I knew Asia really, really well. My last video about Asia comparing the UHQR to the other releases was well informed. The other releases, frankly, have been just, you know, because I am a completist, neurotic, person, but also a way of getting me into this band. I mean, I was always hesitant in a little way. It's, I understand the whole notion of this being dad rock and all of that kind of stuff, which is fine. I listen to a lot of that stuff that sort of gets lumped into that, certainly the yacht rock idiom. I like melodicism, and I think a lot of it is that I was sort of, I found either the radio hits a little bit twee or for lack of a better word, just not really sort of connecting with me in a real strong way, or the album tracks just a little bit too esoteric within the context, which is very interesting because I listen to a lot of weird stuff. I mean, Zappa comes to mind, which is also incredibly well recorded, which also has virtuosic performances. But I think it took me a while to get into this, and I had to think of it sort of like, in some ways, Miles Davis's bands. Also Zappa to a certain extent, but certainly Miles Davis and the fact that once they started leaning into what Steely Dan was doing in the studio and sort of almost casting like a movie certain talents and certain sounds, this drummer for this song, this drummer for this song, and really paying attention to that within the context of an album, it really opened things up for me quite a bit. But what that did mean is that it's not until these records were that really sort of comes to the fore that it really does truly begin to connect with me, which is how I finally took time to really explore Asia in, in depth, and I've been doing that for many, many years. Gaucho, their follow-up record, is not one that I did that particularly with, for no particular reason, nor Kitty Light, the one that came before, which again was delayed and is coming soon. But some of the other Steely Dan records, I'm glad I have them in my collection, I've listened to them a couple times, we've talked about them on the channel. And there's moments that are great, but they're not truly connecting with me. Whereas Gaucho feels, it's sort of like Tusk is to Rumors, if that makes any sense. Look, Rumors is so overplayed and so, you just know every note of it so much, sort of like Dark Side of the Moon or even Crumb of the Century or anything like that. But sometimes if you've just given it a few weeks, few months, maybe a few hours, a few days, and you just listen to something like Rumors again, or Asia, and you just put yourself into what the album is giving you, it's an extraordinary uh, experience. I don't quite feel the same way as Gaucho, with Gaucho, but this was my opportunity to sort of own it on vinyl in what I believe to be the definitive version, um, uh, and we'll talk to that in a second. First, we're gonna crack the thing open, see the usual stuff inside, but why not? You will get, of course, a bunch of a bunch of material, on the inside, advertising and the like, we're gonna get the original album done. It's one of the things that I always commend Analog Productions doing, is that if you don't want this Fakakta box, you can go ahead and store it somewhere else. You can throw it out if you want. I don't care, it's your purchase. But you actually have a numbered version of the original jacket style that you actually can listen to. Unlike, let's say, the Mobile Fidelity One Steps, where you basically have just sort of a thin cardboard replication of it inside the actual box. So we slide this out as per usual, and behold, as we've come to expect, we have the UHQR, look, they do plating, they do pressing, quality control, packaging. Now back to the Miles Davis stuff, I was not super happy with a lot of what was being done, but I really think over the years, Dave Analog Productions has really got this down, unsurprisingly, as they keep doing it, uh, 
um, it, it's working out well. There's the Clarity Vinyl and the UHQR patents, as they like to brag about for justifiable reasons. Here's the Tech Specs card showing off the Clarity Vinyl pellets. And just a nice, you know, ubiquitous bunch of extra chushka say, hey, look what great job we're doing. Similarly, the advertising for this has been updated because look, there's Asia. The last major release. And what do we have here? We have Gaucho, of course, Coltrane and the White Stripes Elephant, which is the first one they did on black instead of brown. Not something I picked up. And then they're showcasing stuff we've showcased definitely on the site here. Here are the... And, uh, the Atlantic 75 stuff. So you have things like face value, you have things like um, selling in by the pound, the Ray Charles mono. I've, I have a surprising amount, not surprising, how surprising is it? I have a number of these uh, and it keeps going, but there's the uh, sort of logo for the 75th anniversary in the top corner there. And then we have back in stock 45 RPM box sets. This is actually a big deal. We talked about this on some of the other channels, but these 45 sets, they're not UHQR, but they're sort of, my real introduction to this label in some ways was the Harry Belfonte, live at Carnegie Hall, which is one of my sort of profoundly important records to me. And to be able to have that in a definitive version that also includes some of the bonus tracks that were only ever, ever available on CD was my introduction to, hey, this is a record label that produces some really amazing stuff long before I knew about the classic records plates, long before I knew about any of that stuff. I just bought the set from this company called Analog Productions. And that sort of led me onto a very expensive journey. Anyway, what else do we have in here? Well, we have this, this is nice. We have the Steely Dan Gaucho liner notes by Daniel, Donald Fagan. And we have, again, a little spiel from Fagan and showing off the master tapes. Are these master tapes? Are these safety masters? Dolby A? It's gonna tell us what they are, hypothetically. Um, Cause there will be at some point in time, I believe a sparse code or one of those things that they have on the back of the record. We're gonna look for that there. This is, I believe one of the ones that was a safety master, but we will see in a second. I, I will add, add add something to this once we actually figure that out. I have just forgotten, it's so hard to keep track. You're like, Analog Productions, it's gotta be the Analog Masters. Not so fast. On the back, again, this pamphlet's a little bit crunchy, but what can we do? What's nice is that you actually have an extension there of all the performers per track. We'll get to that in a second, because that is, for me, the biggest deal about this record. Um, the albums themselves come in a separate sleeve so that you don't get any seam splits, which is nice. And both of them in QRP rice paper. And you can see the clear clarity, no carbon, blah, blah, blah vinyl. The sort of milky white, there we go. And yeah, this is side A, side B. Side A looks very much like a side C. It's like a weird font. Um, that they selected, but uh, you know, it does what we need it to do now that it's a two record set because of 45 RPM. I think you'll just, you'll figure it out about which one's which. Put it in your gate, uh, gate fold the way that you want it to be. Both records here. And then the last thing in the box, as expected, is the sleeve artwork. It is numbered. This one is 1963, it happens to be. And if I crack it open carefully without, oh, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the same as like peeling plastic off. Like you like that sound, but you're sort of cautious of that sound. And yeah, once again, we actually have lyrics and a recapitulation of the artists that are on each track. Um, we do not have a specific sparse code on this that indicates what it is done. Let's see if it actually says anything in here quickly. Nope, but I mean, if we go to Master Disc, it certainly looks pretty analog tapey, Dolby A. So this might be an EQ Safety Master. I don't know, but somebody can let me know in the comments what the actual details are. But I'll actually incorporate that and include in the description the best of my understanding about what it is. Now, thanks to the pleasure of uh, what is it, what does Technology Connection say? Thanks to the magic of buying two of them, we have. I've already listened to this, and I can say unequivocally, it's the best version on vinyl I've ever heard of Gaucho. But it's also the first version on vinyl I've ever heard of Gaucho. I've had the five one mix of this, and it's 
unlike Asia, the 5.1 Max is, is great and it's highly detailed, but it's even more clinical. In some ways, it's even more 80s, which is interesting because it's still very much a 1970s record. But again, I never really got into it in a way. And what's really nice about the ability to actually engage with this on vinyl, at least in my setting setup, is that I find it much more involving. I'm, I'm, I'm swallowed into the music. Even for something like the, the first two tracks are a great example. That's the ones that I listened to multiple times to sort of contrast because they're so differently recorded that it's fascinating that it's on the same record. So if you, we conveniently can do this on the back. If you look at Babylon Sisters, which is this sort of weird, it's almost plotting, but it's kind of this sort of jerky, it's not funky, it's, it's, but it's certainly rhythmic and it's certainly soulful. It's this weird in-between thing. The background vocals by the likes, I mean, there's amazing people on here. Patty Austin's on here, Tony Wine's on here, are, are unbelievable. The horn section crushes it. I mean, it's, it's Randy Brecker, Michael's on later tracks, Tom Scott. I mean, these are like <laughs> icons of icons in terms of people doing horn tracks at the time. But immediately, as soon as it starts, you just, you feel the solidity of the purdy shuffle i mean it's everyone talks about it in asia i mean obviously rosanna shuffle is very much this which is interesting because the next track is of course jeff Picaro. but you have in babylon sisters this sort of intense pulse so as i said it's not quite funky but it's incredibly soulful and it's this very interesting, right in the period, you know, this goes both high and low. 1980, drum machines were about to become a major, major thing. A very particular song signature was about to get there. But when you hear Babylon Sisters, it absolutely could be something from almost any decade. If it came out now, it would still be... It's, it's as pristine as a modern recording, but it swings like hell. Uh, and that is so much because of, obviously, Bernard the King that is pretty pretty, and Chuck Rainey on bass. I mean, the monster that is Chuck Rainey on bass. Uh, we got Don Gronick on electric piano. Incredible sound on the EP on this. And right from the get-go, again, I've been frustrated a lot of times with a lot of these pressings. They've been a little bit noisier, especially than some of the one steps, the VR900, I guess it is, that the other one step people use, Clarity Vinyl hasn't lived up to the hype. This was super, super quiet. The noise floor is very far down, which is great. And right from the instance, you just hear the clarity. <laughs> you hear the exquisite mastering of this particular version. It really is tremendous. Uh, the recording's unbelievably good. That's not surprising. One Grammy for um, uh, Best Engineered Record, I believe. But it is so exquisite. And you find yourself listening to the song and, and hearing all the intricate parts. And, but more importantly, not disparately, you hear them, how they integrate. How, these, how, how the EQ is less about separating things, but making them all fit like a giant puzzle piece. It's amazing. And then when you go to Hey 19, which again is fine it's a fine song it's not my favorite but it's got a really cool uh, I, I love the counter melody and the background vocals and the guitar is so cutting it's like stabbing you the human crack and guitar part but the it's the drums by rick morata <laughs> i think i said jerry earlier but yeah R uh, rick morata doing the drums and they're so different than Bernard Purdy. Like, just play those two songs. If uh, if somebody didn't know that they'd be on the same record, it's not just how he's playing. It's the drum sounds, everything, everything about just the drum recording is so radically different that it's the same as what we tend to get with guitars, with synths. That you're just going to have these gigantic swings between different songs. This song will have crazy distorted guitar. This one will have an acoustic sound. These drums between just these first two tracks show the adventurousness that they were doing at the time. Again, casting individuals, individual drum sounds, production styles, swing styles, rhythmic styles, timing styles, all in one sort of cohesive whole. Glamour for Profession, the uh, title track, Gaucho. Um, time Out of Mind, My Rival in Third, World Man. These are cohesively as a record, it is a much superior experience than listening to these out of context. And what's nice about this record is that you can sit down, listen to it, and get something, I think, quite astonishing. It's 
I am so, so pleased about this particular release. I was a little cautious about it. I'm like, it's such, you know, it's like, how big of a deal can it really be? I absolutely admit that maybe a first pressing of this might be stunning. I don't have the equivalent like I did with Asia with like a Cisco to compare it to or any of that stuff to know how big of a deal, but I was obviously incredibly enthused by the Asia release on UHQR, and I generally think, just from first listening, even if I don't have to AB, even if I don't have to treat it as a review exercise, even I can just sit down and listen, this is the first time for me that Gaucho really sang, that it really sort of opened up, and that this record is something that I think I will go to more and more. And this is what I was hoping for from this series, was to get something that was so clearly wonderfully presented, but also allowing me to sort of dive deeper into this catalog for a band, as I said, I sort of respected it at a distance, but never truly got into. I, I think Gaucho might be my way into this record, which may not, sort it doesn't have to live up to, you know, just like Tusk, again, it doesn't have to live up to the elegance and perfection of something like Rumors, but I can still find lots to love about it. And, and that's it. And I guess by this metric, I'm looking forward to Katie Lied because I guess that's the, like the Fleetwood Mac record. Um, timing's actually pretty close too, if you actually think about how we're doing this right in terms of the time period. Anyway, that's my look, my, my opening and my first uh, impressions of Steely, Steely Dan's Gaucho on our UHQR release from Analog Productions. I hope you take a listen and let me know in the comments what you think about this particular release. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on social media. And yeah, again, I look forward to hearing from everybody and happy listening. All the best. See you next video. Thanks, Jeff.